last video when we found out from Steve Quayle that the DNA of one of the pharaohs was found not to be human. I want to play a larger clip of that to show you what else he said. Important revelation of the attempt to destroy human genetics is underway. Now, last year in 2021, a study came out and we're going to put it up on the screen for you. And this is the most astonishing headline, which I never saw until Daniel Holdings presented it and said, wow, why we're dealing with all the Egyptian artifacts and the alien interface in Mexico is the central theme of history throughout the world. I've said it so many times, but I want to reiterate it. The Egyptians, the very first Egyptians were fallen angels. Their civilization is what the fallen angel civilization prior to what even the creation of Adam and Eve in that pre-Adamic period is those the it's the fallen angels slash that built the great pyramids of the world, absolutely the greatest megalithic uh, temples in the world. And you're going to see it in real time playing out of why this is so critical. Now, a new DNA study reveals that Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten or Amenhotep IV was a human-alien hybrid. Now, you might think this is crazy until you understand that a scientific team in Switzerland pretty much did a gene print, a massive gene print on the different pharaohs and one of them came up with an alien hybrid DNA because they could compare normal human DNA. So that got me to thinking, why do the pharaohs always wear headdresses like this with a cobra on top? And why do the Egyptian artifacts show this snake creature with wings? What is this thing? Could these creatures actually be Angels? Could they be seraphim? So, seraphim, their name comes from the word seraph, to burn. So seraphim may mean something like the burning ones. Okay, well, where do they come from? Going further into seraphim's name reveals its origins. The Hebrew word for a venomous serpent of the desert is seraph. In ancient Egypt, the cobra was often referred to as the flaming one, an image of which, called a uraeus, was worn by the pharaoh. Thus, seraph may be the Hebrew term for cobra, and perhaps where our seraphim get their winged appearance from. Wasn't Satan referred to as a snake in the Bible, in the Garden of Eden? Wasn't it a snake that tempted Eve? Remember when the snake was cursed by God, and its punishment was that it was going to be crawling on its belly from now on? That infers that it must have gotten around some other way other than crawling previous to that. And having wings would make sense. He probably didn't look like this. He probably actually looked like this. You know, the Bible says he masquerades as an angel of light. Lucifer actually means light bringer. And that would make sense if seraphim were called burning ones. Let's hear from Michael Heiser. He's extremely qualified to talk about these issues. And Matthew's question is, he would love to hear Mike's take on what the seraph are, particularly in relation to the bronze snake incident in Numbers. And Lindsay wants to know, should we imagine there being any kind of physical resemblance between real divine beings and their representative images have found throughout history? That is, do seraphim really look like snakes with wings? Well, I mean, you do they really look like snakes with wings? But this, this takes us into all sorts of things. There's, boy, this is one of those cases where I wish, you know, there were certain journal articles that were sort of publicly available. And I'm trying to, I'm racking my brain here. This one might actually be uh, publicly available because it's from Biblica. Uh, so if you want to Google Biblica, B-I-B-L-I-C-A, and then journal and put in the last name P-R-O-V-E-N-C-A-L, okay? 
Uh, I think his first name is Philip, but, I, but I'm, I'm, I could be mistaken there. There's an article on the the term Saraf, the, the Saraf terminology. And I think this is really a good article because it goes into the, the zoology uh, behind the terminology. And there's a lot of good material in this, in this journal article about how the term, the biblical term Saraf, which is often kind of assumed to, to be the verb, you know, to burn, uh, sort of th- that, that typical view kind of overlooks the fact that we also have a noun here and we have an Egyptian term, SRF, okay, for, for lack of, you know, being able to illustrate hieroglyphs here. But we have a, uh, an Egyptian term of the same consonants that means snake, okay, and specifically, you know, this idea of a winged serpent isn't actually a, a serpent with like wings like a bird, it comes from cobra imagery, where you know, as a, when you're looking at a cobra, it it can it, it the skin on the on the sides of it can become sort of flanges, you know, that that protrude from its body on either side. That is where the the ancient you know Semitic idea of the winged you know serpent comes from, because it looks like it's it's got appendages. And this this terminology again from Egypt really kind of covers. Both the burn and the, and the serpent, because you know you have certain parts of the Middle East that where you had spitting cobras, and if you were hit by the venom, it would burn, or if you're bitten, it would burn. You know, so the fiery serpents—they're not like serpents that are flames, you know, kind of, you know, flitting around in the sand. It, it's 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 metaphorical language for the the pain that it inflicts, and you have the same situation going on on here. So you have. You have seraph to burn, you have seraph, you know, serpent, and they, they're kind of like two sides of the same coin. So as far as the terminology, I think that is, you know, the, the, the right way to understand the term itself. It's not just burn. It, it, it also, again, is serpent. And so when you go to the biblical seraphim, you know, the question is, is this actually what a seraphim looks like? Well, you know, on one level, yeah, if you're, if you're Isaiah, you're in the, in the throne room and you encounter, you know, if you're in the throne room of God, you encounter a, a seraphim, you know, well, shouldn't, shouldn't this be the way they look like? Well, the problem with that is you have, you know, a, a seraph, an SRF in, in Egypt. This particular term is also used of a divine throne guardian. You say, well, why is that a problem? Well, because the Bible not only uses that term for a divine throne guardian, but it also uses Cherub, Karuv, Akkadian, uh, which again in in Mesopotamian you know, thinking is also a throne guardian. So you can't really have a throne guardian that looks like a, a serpent, and then you know, well, I, did it change its appearance when it looks like a you know a cherub, a winged you know kind of bovine character or something like that, you know, or a winged you know leonine character, depending on the the Mesopotamian iconography. I, I don't. I don't think we can. We can look at this material and say, "Hey, you know, if if like, well, I'm walking down the road someday and I'm encountered by a seraphim, this is what they're going to look like." I don't think that's the point. I think these terms are used of divine beings whose specific role is thought to be guarding the throne of the Almighty. Lucifer was known as the covering cherub or a throne guardian, according to Ezekiel chapter twenty-eight. Listen to this fascinating Bible reading from that chapter. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes were prepared in thee in the day thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground, 
I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. Now let's go back to what Steve Quayle was saying. He mentioned that there was a pre-Adamic race prior to Adam. That's what pre-Adamic means. But what were they? Were they a race of fallen angels or something else? Or a mixture of fallen angels and other types of beings? I actually don't know the answer to that question, but I am looking into it. Now, I want my sources to be Christians who believe in the scriptures and not these ancient alien folks that try to undermine the Bible. I find Timothy Elberino to be quite credible, so I'm going to put a short clip of his here, and you decide. Follow us online at skywatchtv.com. In, in your book, Birthright, you cite the book Earth's Earliest a Ages, which was written 1876 by George H. Pember. Why is this book, 150 years old, why is this book relevant today? Pember was uh, a very um, respected, prominent theologian of his time, and, and he wrote that book in response to uh, new geological discoveries that, that had been made in the scientific community that were pointing to an old earth. Mm -hmm. Pember um, was kind of providing an alternate explanation because uh, a lot of his colleagues were still trying to argue for a young earth. And he felt like this was a, I think he called it a, a fruitless errand or something to this effect. And, and, so he, and so he was, he wanted to sort of unburden uh, uh, ministers of the time for having to defend a young earth and show them, hey, wait a minute, there's a whole paradigm here for an old earth. It's perfect, it fits perfectly within the context of the biblical narrative, and you should embrace it instead of instead of sort of um, you know going out and fighting this this fighting this battle that's that's really unnecessary. It has no bearing on the gospel. The age of the earth has no bearing on the gospel of Christ. Right. And so he wrote the book, I think, as a response to that. And if you read the book, you kind of get that feeling that that's why he wrote it. And he did a very good job. He was it's very erudite, and it's 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 a very well written book, and it's beautiful. It's it's written in that uh, that. Uh, you know that that old uh, what is it the seventeenth century prose or whatever it is it's it's well it's really the nineteenth century prose because that's when he was writing but he lays out an argument for an old earth and uses the 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 story of Genesis and um, he demonstrates that the initial the beginning of Genesis, that there's a different way to read the first verses of Genesis. Well, yes, first couple of verses of Genesis, uh, reading from the English Standard Version here, is uh, pretty similar to the version most of us are familiar with. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, or some of the, uh, like the King James, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. The earth was without form and void. It, it sounds like in the first two verses here that this was all just... Uh, Prelude. God created the heavens and right. the earth, and the earth was still brand new. It still hadn't taken shape mm -hmm. yet. Uh, Pember argues that there's a better translation for verse 2 yes. that helps to understand that the earth's age is older exactly. than what had previously been taught by churches, by, by theologians. Yeah, the reading of the Masoretic text makes gives you the a sense that you're looking at just a uninterrupted continuation of events, mm -hmm. right? Um, whereas Pember believe that what we have in our Masoretic translation is, is not actually the most accurate rendering of, of that verse. And he goes through a whole lot of scholarship to show that there are, there's another way to translate verse 2. He points out that scholars, prominent scholars in his time and, and in our time also, have, have demonstrated that that verse can be rendered with all of the piece and parts that they go through, which I won't go through here, which all the pieces and parts that they, they change the translations of, that these alternate translations, that that verse should be more accu accurately rendered as, 
In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, but the earth became desolate and empty, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And in my book, I go through how he came to arrive at this rendering, and it's, and it's, um, it's good scholarship. It's not just him trying to, to rework the text to fit his own paradigm. It's very good scholarship. And in fact, the word here, I think the most dynamic word in this new rendering is the word but, because that totally changes mm-hmm. the paradigm. In the beginning, God created the heaven, heavens and the earth, full stop. Right? That's a one sentence, full stop. That was an event that took place sometime in the past. And then you have the word, instead of and, as the King James renders it, you have how the Septuagint renders it, which is, but the earth became desolate and empty. That's a whole nother story here. So now you have a situation that implies that something happened. Something happened that caused the earth to become uh, desolate and empty. So there's what people call a gap, and this is mm-hmm. why this is why this is referred to as the gap, the gap theory. theory. Yeah. Now the uh, Septuagint translation. This was translated by seventy Jewish scholars at Alexandria, Alexandria yep. about three hundred years before Jesus was born. So this suggests that the understanding among Jewish religious scholars, at least until the time of Jesus, the leading scholars, the yep. leading scholars, mm-hmm. was that. This was the proper way to understand it. That something happened there, that and we read in in uh, the the book of Isaiah that God did not create the earth to be void. He created it to be inhabited. Inhabited. That's right. So yeah. something happened here, and this is what this was. Was this what what Pember was arguing that something happened between verse one and verse two that caused the earth? To become formless and void. This was the. Re- is this the rebellion that you were talking about? Yes, and 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 Pember. Uh, believes and so do I that the earth was in a, was was in a a state of desolation, utter desolation post judgment. In other words, there was a catastrophic a catastrophic event that rocked the earth before the creation of Adam, and so you find the earth in a state of darkness, water covering the earth. It's it's post judgment, and he points out that this is, and he goes in, into the scriptures again, which I trace his thinking in, in my book and, and demonstrate why he comes to these conclusions. But he believes that the that we're, what we're looking at is the earth in a state of post judgment, and that it's actually it's actually symbolic. The earth being in this state, it's symbolic of of and is referenced. He believes in in the New Testament of uh, of baptism. You know that 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 the water represents the death and the darkness, and we know that um, when you're submerged in water, it represents the death and the darkness and the gloom, and more than anything, it, it represents the judgment of God that that we are are um, condemned. We're condemned with the dragon, according to the scriptures. We're condemned with. We're not just condemned on our own. We're condemned with the dragon. Hell was created for the devil and his angels, not for us, but we are condemned with him if we defy the Father like they did. And again, we're siblings, so um, we have a in- co-inheritance with uh, our, the, our elder siblings who are still loyal to the Father, or we, are, or we are mutually condemned with the other guys that have defied the Father, that have rebelled against the Father. So I think this is brilliant by Pember, where he, he shows that the earth being covered in water and this, this darkness is a, in a, in a fitting depiction of this condemnation and death, and condemnation with the dragon, and that baptism is, is, is a portrayal of us dying and, 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 and being redeemed from this and coming out of the water, and just as he, you know, the, God parts the clouds and everything, and, and, the, and, and, and the waters submerge and the dry land appears, that this is a new birth and a new beginning, a new creation in Christ. And I think it really is a beautiful, uh, and it's a, it's a beautiful allegory of, of being reborn in Christ and of baptism and, and, and as it relates to the, the, the earth in a state of post-judgment. And it really fits very nicely. And you'll see, if you read my book or if you read Pember's book, you'll see how he connects this to some of the statements in the New Testament by the apostles, and you go, wow, that, I, I, it, you, really, you really get the feeling that they are referencing this post-judgment state in the earth um, that, that was, the, was the condition of the planet before Adam was created and, and, and how that mirrors our, the, the, the renewal in Christ Jesus. So to wrap all of that up, Pember believed, and as do I, and I make the case in my book, that the, that the earth was not created 
in that seven-day sequence at the beginning of Genesis. Rather, the earth was renewed. So the earth was already existent. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, full stop, but the earth became desolate and empty and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And then the process is God is gradually renewing the earth, replenishing it. And that the culmination of all this is the creation of a new sibling in the family of God, Adam, who is appointed to govern the earth. Mm. This dynamic of, of, of human dominion, that only human beings have the right to rule planet Earth, which, which I think is actually a biblical, not actually, it's definitely a biblical concept. You know, the Bible says in the Psalms, the heavens, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. That was never rescinded. The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. That was not rescinded, nor shall it ever be rescinded. The earth was given, it was bequeathed to Adam and his offspring forever. And so um, that's why, for example, we find uh, Jesus who makes this, this statement, this very powerful statement in the New Testament where he says that, that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him in heaven as the son of God, on earth as the son of man. 